Thank you, Jess, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real honor to be here up on the main stage at the end of what's been a really inspiring day. And I'm going to talk about a subject which is very close to my heart, but also the future sustainability of our Earth, which is glaciers. But it's also more than that, because actually this is an area where there's been huge use of geospatial data and expertise to understand what's happening with glaciers and to predict that, and even more potential in the future. So what I'm going to do this afternoon are three things. I'm going to take you on a global glacial journey to explain why do glaciers matter and what's happening to them. We're then going to take a deep dive actually into the Peruvian Andes, where we're uncovering entirely new dimensions to glacier change that five years ago or so we didn't even think were happening. And then lastly, thinking a little bit about what are the solutions locally to adapting to these changes, and how can geospatial data and expertise help? So I've been studying glaciers most of my adult life. I'm fascinated by glaciers. There are these enormous rivers of ice that form in the mountains or in the poles, where so much snow accumulates that it can't all melt off of the following year. And eventually, so much ice builds up that it starts to deform under its own weight and flow. And that's what makes a glacier a glacier, is flow. There are 200,000 odd glaciers all the way around the world in different mountain regions, the Himalayas, the Andes, North America, huge number of glaciers. And that's without even thinking about our ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, where glaciers are growing so large they engulf the entire continent, subsuming mountain ranges, even volcanoes, these huge, huge domes of ice. But the uncomfortable part of this story is that we know the Earth is warming, and unfortunately, many of the places where we find glaciers are heating up at rates greater than the global mean. For example, the Arctic has warmed three times the global average at the moment, and we also see strong warming in some mountain regions. So anywhere that looks red or yellow on this map, it is warming fast. And that's important because that's causing our glaciers to tip out of balance and become less healthy. So we look at satellite images of glaciers all around the world and map what's happened to their elevation. We can see that thinning rates in the mountains for glaciers have doubled over the past two decades. And we have sustained losses of mass from Greenland and parts of Antarctica. So you can see the, the red areas there and the yellow is, is where we're seeing mass loss of glaciers over roughly the last two decades. And that's important because glaciers are actually fairly vital to us as human beings. They're the greatest freshwater store on the planet. They contain 70% of Earth's fresh water. And that fresh water supply supports maybe over a billion people in the high mountains and low mountains around the world. Actually, if you go to the upstream parts of river basins where there are glaciers there, a lot of that river water is actually glacial meltwater. A good example of that is, is the River Indus, which drains from the head, in its headwaters in India and Pakistan and then goes down through to Pakistan and supports one of the biggest irrigated areas of land in the world. In the rivers that feed that, the tributaries, they're over 90% glacial meltwater. And glaciers are amazing because they store up water when it's wet and cold, and they release it when water is scarce during warm and dry periods as a steady drip feed of glacial meltwater. But as glaciers shrink and become ever more diminished, that glacial meltwater supply will start to reduce, it might be replaced by rainfall, but rainfall is unpredictable, it's episodic. So you're replacing a nice, reliable source of water with something that you can't easily predict. So that creates a crisis. But all that water has to go somewhere, and the ultimate destination for glacial meltwater is the oceans. Um, and so we know that that has an impact on our sea levels. Sea levels are rising at about four millimeters per year at the moment, and that's accelerating. And about half of that, roughly, is coming from glacial meltwater. What you can see here is uh, from the Intergovernment Pan Panel on Climate Change report from last year, showing sea level rise since about 1980. And you can see two different lines. One is a, a, a low emission scenario for if we dramatically cut greenhouse gas emissions, and one is a very high emission scenario. And you can see they fan out and show very high uncertainty the further towards 2100 you go. And actually, the uncertainty is partly linked to the future of our glaciers and how they respond with increasing contributions from glacial meltwater to future sea level rise going future forward into this century. And that has the potential to impact millions of people living in coastal regions all around the world. 
But it's not just glacial meltwater in the oceans that impacts our sea level, it also has other impacts. It has impacts on our oceans and how, water, how currents circulate in our oceans and regulate the distribution of heat around our ocean basins. A prime example is the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, often known as AMOC. And this is a really important series of currents which work like a conveyor belt, moving cold water south and warm water north. Basically, it evens up the distribution of heat between the equator and the poles. And so what, one of the things that drives this current, actually, is around the, the seas around Greenland, we have salty, dense water sinking. And that cold, salty, dense water moves south. And then to balance that, you have a warm water current moving north, the offshoot of which forms our Gulf Stream, and, and creates warm climatic conditions across Europe. And we know that the strength of this current seems to be becoming weaker. And we think that that is partly linked to uh, meltwater supply to those oceans, particularly around Greenland. And more meltwater from the ice sheets, the, the impact of that is it, it causes uh, it reduces the sinking of the dense, salty water in the north because it makes it fresher and lighter and less easily to sink. And the strength of that circulation pattern uh, starts to weaken, as you can see on the diagram on the right there. Will it collapse? We think it's pretty unlikely, but it's not completely implausible. But weakening and, and changes to this circulation, it changes major patterns of heat distribution, and it has the potential to cause abrupt shifts in weather patterns and the water cycle. So glacier change might be local to the mountains and the poles, but its impact is global. And that's not just for people living in the mountains or around the coast, it's also all of us living throughout Europe and who are affected by the climate, um, which links to how water circulates in our oceans. I've seen these changes with my own eyes. Um, I started off as a 20-year-old in a tiny little village in the Swiss Alps called Arolla. And I woke up every day to this uh, image on the left, which is the um, lower Arola Glacier icefall, huge river of ice flowing down, feeding a glacier below. It's a really stunning and impressive thing to wake up to every morning. It was one of the things that inspired me to become a glaciologist. But I went back there in 2018 to, for a visit, and I was astonished to see the glacier had dramatically thinned, shrunk, and it had been severed in the middle, where it had lost ice. It's no longer feeding ice to its lower trunk, which will then stagnate, melt away, and be lost. And this is the future. And what's astonishing is that's happened in a quarter of a human lifetime. So that's quite a dramatic change. But what I've been talking about here is about water quantity, the amount of water we have. And we know glaciers are important for that. But what we're starting to realize is that there are other dimensions to this um, around the quality of the water. And we're now going to do a little journey to the tropical Andes of Peru, where I've been working the last few years in collaboration with Peruvian researchers through a project called Cascada, funded by the Newton Paulet Fund. And the tropical Andes, as you can't imagine, isn't the best place for glaciers. It's the tropics. And uh, actually, you find them very high up in the mountains at high elevations, normally above 4,000 meters above sea level, so higher than Mont Blanc. Um, but Peru is very important. It contains sort of 70% of tropical glaciers. But just like most mountain areas of the world, it's warming up over there. This is Pastoruri Glacier, which I visited. Uh, I've visited a few times in the last few years. And the photos on the right there show the changes in Pastoruri since 1986 to 2016. And you can see it's gone from a vast lobe of ice to a thin several chunks of ice, actually. And that's quite common throughout this region. In fact, glaciers have lost about 30% of their area between 2000 and 2016. And the predictions are that they will probably lose about eight, or more than 80% of their area by the end of the 21st century, uh, unless we do something very dramatic with our greenhouse gas emissions. The importance of uh, glaciers here uh, is, is high, um, so the Cordillera Blanca, where we're working, the glaciers there, which are the sort of purple dots in this map, they feed meltwaters to a, a river called the Rio Santa, and this is a very high area of, of water demand for hydroelectric power, agriculture, mining, and towns. Uh, but in the dry season, we're in the, the tropics here, so you have rainy seasons and dry seasons. In the, rain, in the dry season, the rain stop, and it's the glacial meltwater which keeps those rivers flowing well. So about 40% of the, the river discharge of the Rio Santa is, is glacial meltwater in the dry season. 
But what we're finding out here is it's not just about water quantity. Uh, so this is Shyap Glacier, one of the glaciers we've been studying. And you can see a, a modelled reconstruction of the size of Shyap Glacier on the left there uh, at about the Little Ice Age, so sort of 150-odd years ago. Uh, and it's retreated dramatically since then. Some of that's natural warming, but more recently, that's anthropogenic-induced uh, warming. But if you look at the colour of the landscape in front of Shyap Glacier, you can see it's a rust red. And what's happening is that as the glaciers retreat, they're exposing these rocks. And these particular rocks, they used to be at the bottom of the ocean, actually, but they're full of um, iron sulfide minerals and other types of sulfide minerals. And as that, those minerals get exposed to atmospheric oxygen, they oxidize very quickly. They're very reactive, these minerals, and they release metals and acid to the waters, uh, which is why the whole landscape is red. It's basically rust. And you can see that even more clearly in this photo here, where you've got these very rusty rocks scattered around the margins of, of, of Shyap Glacier. And what we've been studying is the water quality of the rivers in proximity for the, for the glaciers. There are several river basins now where actually uh, it seems to be that the, the river waters are highly acidic. So they're pH 2 or 3, if that means anything to you, but it's about the same acidity as your stomach. It's not very good to drink. And they also have very high concentrations of, of heavy metals, which become soluble, actually, in acidic water. It's quite a similar process, what we think, to what happens in, in mining areas, where you have a mine that's excavated, and you create passageways for water and air, and suddenly your sulfide minerals, which are in the rock, they oxidize very rapidly, and that process releases acid, and it releases metals. It's called acid mine drainage. And glaciers, in many ways, are like natural mines. They, they erode the rock beneath them, and then, actually, that rock becomes very reactive because it's a very fine powder. And it seems to be that the changes in the glaciers here, their retreat and their thinning and exposure of these rocks, is actually causing acidification of these river waters um, in some catchments. The question is, will this happen elsewhere? And we don't know yet. You can see here, this is just a picture of a river coming out at the front of Shyap Glacier. Uh, again, this is about pH 3, 2 or 3, very acidic. And it has high concentrations of nickel and lead dissolved in the waters. Those are the orange triangles. Um, the blue ones are from a glacier that hasn't become toxified yet. And, and the line is the kind of safe drinking water limit. So they're, they're hitting what would be safe for human consumption. This is all linked to glacier change. This seems to have happened through time. This is a picture of Shyap Glacier in 1966. Nice, big glacier, pristine lake, all looks very nice and healthy. And on the, on, on the right there, we have what it looks like in 2019. We were out there, glacier dramatically reduced in size, but you can see the lake is a fairly nasty green color, and that's due to the high concentrations of metals now present in that lake. And this is linked to the retreat of the glaciers interacting with the local geology. But what are the solutions? Because these things are happening, right? And there are you know, millions of people living in mountain regions of the world, and, and some of them may also experience this problem. We, we don't know yet. What's interesting in the Andes is if you go to the, the bottoms of the valleys, you find these natural wetlands. And these natural wetlands are, have lots of pampas grasses and vegetation. And, and the, the grasses there are actually able to take up metals from the water at high concentrations. They, they hyperaccumulate them. So actually, if you go to a valley which has become toxic, you can see in some places that the wetlands are starting to help purify those waters. So one of the things we've been doing is working with local communities in the Cordillera Blanca to take those natural solutions and try and apply them in an artificial context. So creating artificial wetlands, which we then plant out with the same Andean plants that we find in the natural wetlands. So they take up the metals from the water. We put some lime in there that helps neutralize the acidity. And this is really helpful because it helps the communities take charge of their water supply and purify it. But it's hard for them to know whether actually it has worked or not. I mean, I can run a sample through an instrument, and I can see how much metals there, there is in there, but that's quite an expensive process. It's quite a time-consuming process. So the other thing one of my colleagues, Raul Loizemuro, who's been doing in Peru, is he's created an app um, where communities can log 
what species of creatures they find in the riverbed. And some of these creatures are highly tolerant of acid, and some of them are highly sensitive to acid. So depending on what things you see where, you can work out whether your waters have become acidic or whether they are, you know, they're relatively good to drink. And so this actually is a very useful tool that helps communities kind of spatially look at, you know, where are my waters good to drink? Is my wetland working uh, without particularly high cost? But this is in Peru, and this is in a kind of a new dimension to glacier change that we just didn't really know about until quite recently. And we know we've got 200,000 plus glaciers all the way around the world, and we can see them from space, we can see whether they're thinning uh, and how much, but we can't necessarily see what's happening with their water quality. And what we have here is just a graph of um, several different glacier regions, the Andes, Himalayas, Antarctica, Greenland, Patagonia, and some concentrations of heavy metals that we might worry about in water. So lead, cadmium, nickel, arsenic, and mercury. And that the gray bars are the kind of safe limit for drinking water, according to the WHO. And you can see we've got really variable concentrations of these metal species, and that, that reflects the rock the variability in geology in each region. So in the Himalayas, the, the yellow circles, we've got arsenic, which is too high. In the Andes, which is the pink, we've got lead and cadmium and, and nickel, which are really high. So how can we start to think about predicting this in different parts of the world? And I think there's enormous potential for geospatial data and expertise to, to help with this, both in terms of satellite remote sensing, where can we see these rusty rocks in the proximity of retreating glaciers, well, what do we know about the geology that helps us move towards localized understanding of a problem to a global understanding of a potential problem, which you then combine with on-the-ground data for validation and multi-stakeholder dialogues and collaboration with, with communities, water resource managers and government to, to see how you actually start to solve some of these problems and how do you approach it in terms of ad adaptation. So just to summarize, really, I think there's a number of things I'm trying to say, which is... Glaciers are connected to all of us, it, not just people who are living high up in the mountains who, or are living around the coast, but also we're all influenced by climate, and, and glaciers have feedbacks and teleconnections to the ocean and climate system which determine how we live. Their future changes will impact, you know, over a billion people around the world in terms of water supply and in terms of sea level rise. And the only thing that really solves that is reducing our net greenhouse gas emissions through mitigation, climate change mitigation. And, and which path of the way we take, as you saw from the sea level rise graph, really does make a difference. In some parts of the world, you know, what we do can make the difference between saving most of our glaciers or losing most of our glaciers. But actually, on a local scale, these changes are going to happen anyway. You know, it's, uh, even if you stopped emitting right now, glaciers will still continue to melt for some time. So we need somehow to urgently adapt, or communities to ur urgently adapt to these changes, both in terms of quarter quantity, but also the quality of water. And this is where I think the, the future is geospatial, because certainly with water quality, we have a huge diversity of rock types all over the Earth's surface. Glaciers grow on, grow on top of them, they erode that rock, and they make, create this very fine powder. They also then put meltwater on the rock, which releases things like metals into the water. And that's a process that is happening variably across space, such that it might become a problem in one place, and it might not in another, or the dimensions of that problem might be different, depending on the interactions between the rock, the glacier, and the water. And so the problem is geospatial, but the solutions are also, because you have to create solutions which are effective and also work on the ground in real-time sort of socioeconomic context for the people who are living there. And so I think there's enormous potential in this area, and it's more needed more than ever, actually, right now. Thank you very much. <laughs>